you're aware that this meeting is being recorded. As a reminder, uh, please mute yourselves. I do have a mute all button engaged. Uh, it's going to be a crowded room tonight. We're happy to have you all. We're actually officially over the capacity of the in person room we normally have on campus. Uh, normally, every other week during the semester, we have an evening under the stars on campus. And obviously, right now, uh, we are closed due to the global pandemic. And so we're going to do a virtual uh, evening under the stars for you tonight and show you our campus telescope. Uh, to tell you a little bit about our observatory, uh, it was built a little over a decade ago, uh, and we have um, the largest on-campus observatory on the eastern Atlantic, any eastern Atlantic states. I'm going to go ahead and share my connection to the computer and show you some pictures of it. Joining, I'm going to go ahead and do all again. That's a nice button. Better. Apologies for the technical difficulties there. All right, now you can see my screen. All right. There we go. Okay. And let me just see if we've got this button functionality here. No, I have to stop screen screen sharing to do that. Okay, there we go. Reshare my screen. All right, so this is our George Mason University Observatory. What can we use? I ruined my speaker. Take up now. I don't want to watch this. <laughs> Jimmy said, I said no. Okay, everybody's muted again. Uh, sorry about that. This will be fun. Uh, I hope everyone's got 120 people online. This is a, a huge meeting tonight. Uh, all right, let's try one more time as more people are joining. So we'll go ahead and get started in two more minutes. We'll let people go ahead and get connected. While we're waiting, I'll share you some views of our observatory. You're whining and complaining. I'm trying to do this. Yeah. I certainly understand. I have a kindergartner at home myself, and uh, he uh, fortunately just went to sleep. Uh, I understand everyone's been out for over a month, and it's been a it's been a long period. One consequence of flattening the curve is that it also lengthens the curve. Of course, it also saves lives. So I appreciate what everyone's been doing on the call, and I encourage you to continue uh, practicing social distancing, but you're not here about that. You're here to escape some of the things going on here on the earth uh, to the outer universe tonight, and we have a good show for you. So we have a few more minutes for people to join, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Actually, it looks like we're permanently muted, everybody now. I think that looks good. Click that. Okay, great. So now I should be able to share my screen. Uh, we have enough participants, I think, that everybody's been muted by, by default. So this is a live webcam view of our observatory. The sun set about half an hour ago. Uh, here is, on the upper left, a picture of our telescope. And I'm going to go ahead and um, bring the telescope down so you can take a look at it on our webcam. Uh, the bottom left view is a view of the dome from the roof. More time. There we go. Um, back to screen sharing. Apologies, I can't mute all unless uh, I stop screen sharing. That'll be a slight challenge tonight. Also, not watching the chat right now, but we have some of our observatory assistants on the call uh, who will um, be able to uh, answer some questions for you as the night goes on. 
and I'll periodically be able to check the chat as well. Screen sharing again. Get there. People are getting connected. Please hang in there. Just Apple U. Okay, I've got a command. I can do this maybe uh, automatically. Okay. All right, so in the upper right, we have a view of our control room. You'll notice it's empty. I'm actually doing this from home uh, as well. We are connecting to the telescope that controls our observatory uh, via this is a standard commercial uh, night owl. And I'm on the laptop. Everybody, nope. That's just right. That's right. Okay, everybody's muted again. As a reminder, if you're just joining the meeting, there we go. So this is our observatory control computer. I have just put the webcam away, but let me bring it back up and move it over to the side. This is a fully computer controlled uh, telescope. And uh, we have a controller for our camera here. We have a controller for our observatory here. We're actually gonna hop over right away while it's still light out uh, to uh, Venus in a little while to take a look at it uh, before it sets. And it's crescent phase. Then we'll take a look at the moon tonight too. Uh, those are some of views. This is a virtual representation of our sky that I'm dragging around here. The red is the thing you see flipping back and forth is uh, kind of a, a frame of reference. But you see a grid of lines on the night sky that's like latitude and longitude for uh, astronomers. We call those right ascension Sorry, explanation. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, start playing with the telescope. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect to it. Uh, it's connected now, and we're going to unpark it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it very close to the webcam, which is around here on the sky, if I recall correctly. And I'm going to go ahead and slew the telescope, which is a fancy word for move the telescope. And then we'll go over to the webcam. Hey, P. Watch the telescope. Yes. You, we can only see a white screen. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Who's, who's this? Maria. Thanks, Maria. Uh, please mute. Um, if you can, in the, okay, some people can see just fine. Okay, so if you're having problems Here. seeing the screen, I apologize. Hey, Pete, if you can hear me, go up to participant and select mute on entry. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was, that was easy. Okay. All right, so the telescope is coming down uh, to our point of view, and I'm going to have to Move it a little bit more. Let's watch it come into view. The telescope is a reflecting telescope, and it has uh, uh, that means it uses mirrors instead of lenses. Looks like I overshot a little bit, but it's going to get down to the right. What's coming into the view right now is what we call a secondary mirror. The light comes down from the sky, uh, down through the white tube that you see on the screen. To, towards the big mirror at the back, which we'll get a view of later, bounces off the big mirror uh, at the back of the white tube as we're viewing it now on the screen, and goes off the secondary mirror, a smaller mirror on the top, which we see there. I'm going to go ahead and bring it down here, and we're going to get a nice little look at it. Here we go. Uh, so we're bringing the telescope and pointing it right at the webcam. And now you can start to see coming into view the primary mirror uh, at the uh, back of the telescope here. So now we're looking directly at the primary mirror. There we go. Uh, and so that's the big mirror at the end of the telescope tube. The light comes back up to us after reflecting off of that mirror. And then down through a hole, 
in the center of that uh, big mirror and uh, then goes onto the other side of the telescope. And we're gonna go ahead and flip over to Venus now. Uh, so you can uh, see that. And then we'll see the other side of the telescope, the back of the telescope, where we mount things like our eyepiece and our uh, digital camera, which we'll be viewing tonight. Now we're gonna flip the telescope back over goes. Watch it on the camera. Thank you for the tip on mute all as we now have 165 participants. Welcome everyone at uh, George Mason University's virtual evening under the stars. While the telescope is moving over towards Venus, I'm gonna go ahead and start opening the dome to our telescope. And we can watch it begin to open in the lower left. So this process takes almost three minutes to complete. And so while the telescope is opening, I'll go ahead and look at the chat and feel free to answer any questions that people may have. Thank you, Dorothy, for the tip on mute on entry. Yeah, if anyone is having problems with uh, viewing the video, please let us know. We can see the telescope dome is opening now in the lower left shutter. There's basically a slit between the two halves of the dome. The top part is now rolling off uh, to the back and then a the lower shutter after that is done is gonna start lowering in front of us. In the lower left, oh yeah, I got a question from Anna. Are we gonna do this again? Yes, we probably will. Uh, since we have uh, so many people online, we're also recording this and we'll go ahead and post this for people to watch. We're now seeing in the upper left, the back of the telescope coming to view. We had a question from Raymond, does ASCOM control the scope or just the dome? Uh, primarily just the dome. Uh, we use uh, the SkyX for controlling the, um, the telescope by a company named Software BISC. Uh, if there are no lenses, how is the image magnified? That's a question from Michelle. That's a great question. Um, the magnification uh, does relate to how the mirrors are curved. It still does some magnification, but the real power of a telescope is not in its magnification, uh, although it does help, but also uh, in its ability to gather light. You can imagine a telescope is a bit like a rain bucket. The bigger uh, the bucket, the more rain you can collect. And so similarly, photons coming from our universe distant universe, it's, it's better to have a bigger telescope to collect those photons. We're now starting to see the lower shutter, uh, lower on the, uh, the lower left screen here. Uh, and that's done with hydraulic pumps, uh, hydraulic uh, uh, mechanism with uh, hydraulic fluid opening the lower shutter. The upper shutter was done with electric motor. The top left, we see we're now pointed at Venus and we have uh, the primary mirror, uh, the back the primary mirror is this silver circle that we're seeing in the center that's held on to that telescope with that black metal uh, octagon shaped looking uh, structure and the light from the telescope will come through a hole in the middle of that primary mirror and then we see a small silver cylinder that is a third mirror uh, as the dome is opening we can now see the telescope through the dome on the dome viewing camera. But on the back of the telescope, we have a digital camera, and that's what we're going to be looking through tonight. Just some words of warning. Uh, so set some expectations and lower the bar for what you're going to see tonight. This is a research grade digital camera. It only collects one color of light at a time. And so in this case tonight, we're going to be seeing grayscale images of what we're going to look like. It's not going to look like some of the beautiful views that you see 
uh, with from the Hubble Space Telescope or in uh, pictures on the internet. Uh, but we will get some beautiful real time live views of what our sky looks like. All right, so the dome is finished opening. I'm going to go ahead and turn it face uh, the direction that the telescope is pointed. So in the upper left, we're now going to see the telescope start to spin. We'll let that go. We can see it spinning in the bottom as well. Uh, what objects are we viewing tonight? Well, we're going to start with Venus, which is at its brightest now. You don't really need a great uh, large telescope to see Venus. You can see the crescent Venus with uh, only your um, small telescope that you can buy at a toy store. Uh, but uh, we'll still get a nice look at Venus tonight through this telescope. We'll then go look at the crescent moon. And then we have some galaxies and clusters to show you tonight. Uh, the clouds are expected to stay away much until at least 11 p.m. And we'll go as long as uh, I can manage. It's actually me. And someone just unmuted. So let me go and mute them again. Now they should be muted again. Thank you. All right, back to the screen. Uh, we're pretty far down into the trees because Venus is getting pretty close to the sun. Now you can see the telescope is coming into place now and the opening over the telescope is looking um, in the direction the telescope is pointed. And uh, you can actually see a star uh, in the field of view. Uh, that's not Venus, but that's something else. Unfortunately, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter are not up at this time of night. If we wanted to see those tonight, we'd have to go uh, very close to uh, dawn to see those. So let's go ahead and go over to our camera and take a look. So this is our digital camera. And let's see if I can still see the chat. Let's bring the chat back up. There it is. Hey, Peter. Yes. You can see the screen again, blank again. Okay, thank you. I am sure the screen should come back any second. Okay, thanks. Other people are reporting they can see it. Every I, I went to go mute someone and then uh, it, it, it turned off and now hopefully it's back again. Okay, so let's go back to the camera. I'm gonna do a very short exposure. Unlike our eyes, with a digital camera, we have the ability to take um, very short or very long exposures and collect light for a long period of time. Our telescope should be close to focused, uh, so we should get a nice image, but let's go ahead and take a look. Um, Venus is really bright right now. It's brighter than any other star in the sky. That's why it often has the nickname the evening star or the morning star. And it'll be coming out here in a minute, and I'll make the screen bigger so we can get a good look at it. Okay, I see nothing right now, so bear with me. Got to get centered and make sure the telescope is focused. There it is. That's a nice, beautiful image of Venus. I'm going to try and uh, get a, a nice, nicer view. It's a very bright image right now. Uh, it's very saturated, but let's go ahead and zoom in further. Uh, this, this Venus is really too bright for our campus telescope. Uh, it collects too much light, but uh, so the entire surface of Venus is washed out. But we can see quite clearly here uh, that Venus is in a beautiful crescent phase, and it's the side that's pointed towards the sun. Uh, you are seeing this tonight. This is the view that um, Galileo first saw slightly over 400 years ago. And you are just among a rare select few of humans uh, who have been able to see this view of Venus. So some people are still reporting a blank screen. I apologize for that, but it might be a network connection. Uh, I do ask everyone that's on the call uh, that if you have your um, video on, please turn it off. Um, and this is being recorded so that you will be able to see it later. Uh, and I apologize for those of you that can't see it uh, on the call, but uh, most people, I'm assuming, can. Yeah, so that's all those pixels there are saturated because Venus is so bright. Uh, let's bring this back there. Let's, let's stretch this a little bit. 
Yeah, there we go. So that's a view of Venus. Uh, and it was a Dan Thomas is writing to me. Uh, and uh, if you switch to the desktop app, it refreshed. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, and if you refresh your browser and reconnect, that'll fix it as well. Uh, thank you for those tips in the chat. Uh, but that is a beautiful view of Crescent Venus. Only humans that have been alive since the time of Galileo have ever been able to see that. But that is the view by which uh, we uh, were first able to prove that Venus went around the sun and not the earth because Venus went through phases uh, much like the moon does and therefore the Venus could not orbit the earth. Uh, with the telescope, how close can we get? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the magnification that I just showed you, that's about the, the limit of what I can do uh, with this camera. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, I don't want to get too technical about the angular resolution of our campus telescope, but there we go. We might be a little bit out of focus too, and I'll tune that up later. Is it going too, too far, too fast? There it is. So for those of you that joined our live show a few weeks ago on Facebook Live, we had a different view of Venus. It was much closer to half illuminated. And so in the couple of weeks uh, that we've been looking at Venus, its, um, it's shape, uh, its illuminated portion has changed because Venus and Earth have moved with one another. So thanks for uh, joining there. I'll go ahead and uh, save that image. So all of our data is stored uh, on our uh, uh, telescope campus. So we, we record data with our campus telescope. Every clear night that we can, uh, we collect data in support of the NASA test mission currently. Uh, in particular, uh, we have helped confirm a planet that's in the so-called Neptune desert orbiting a nearby M dwarf star. Name is TOI, Test Object of Interest 442, the 442nd planet candidate discovered by the NASA test mission. And that paper will be published in the near future. Okay, so let's now take the telescope for a spin. Let's go to the nearby moon. Uh, and uh, let's do that. We have helped confirm an exoplanet with our campus telescope. Now the moon is currently in a crescent phase, uh, which should give us some nice views. We could actually see Venus. Now we actually can't see Venus in this view. Uh, I'm not sure what star that is. That might be serious. We'll find out soon. That we see in the, the dome view. What is between us and Venus? Good question, not a lot. A lot of small particles of um, dust. Uh, someone asked why it is a crescent. Uh, Rob Parks is on the line, Dr. Rob Parks. He's our incoming deputy director of the observatory. Uh, yeah, Venus is 27.5% illuminated tonight. It's a crescent because we're only seeing part of the observer, uh, part of the planet that's illuminated by the sun. We're basically viewing it from an angle. You can imagine taking a basketball or a ball and shining a light on it from different angles, you wouldn't see a full moon versus a new moon, much like our moon goes through. All right, so we've moved over to the moon. I'll go ahead and take a new exposure of the moon. Now this is, again, really, really bright, but we can get a decent exposure uh, in the H alpha filter to take a look at it. There we go. This is a really, it looks like we're slightly out of focus, but here is slight view of our crescent moon. Zoom out a little bit so we can see the full thing. This is our moon tonight. Again, this is really bright. Actually, we're not saturated, so I can play with this and bring out some more features. 
go. So what am I doing right now? I am taking the information that we're getting from the digital camera and stretching how that information is being displayed on our screen. Uh, so in general, a digital camera counts photons as it comes into each pixel. Now we all have selfies, we all have digital cameras now. We have astronomers to thank for that and the military. Uh, the Bell Labs was a, a research organization uh, that invented the basics behind a digital camera. They, really, they were trying to invent a new type of computer memory, but they realized it was sensitive to light. And astronomers were very interested in this because we've been using the glass plates, the equivalent of photographic film, to measure the brightnesses of things in our universe. And that photographic film, when we exposed it, uh, allowed us to only measure brightnesses to the nearest uh, 20 uh, 20%. I'm going to zoom in even further on the moon here so you can get a clear. Looks like this image is slightly out of focus, so I'll have to fix that a little bit later. Let's see if I can clear that up. Go to view, observatory control window. Here's how we adjust the focus on our campus telescope. We move the mirrors around. So I'll move the mirror. And then I'll go ahead and take a new exposure and see if that helps or makes it worse. We'll see. We're also looking really, well, actually, we're not too close to the horizon. But you can see the moon out right now. You can go outside quick, take a look. Uh, the moon indeed was just about a new moon a few days ago. So the moon will be setting soon. Looks like I might have made that worse. So I'm going to go in the other direction. Try and clean up our view of the moon. So I'm moving a mirror, you know, I have glasses on, right? And so what I'm doing is I'm moving a mirror back and forth to adjust where the image of the moon hits our digital camera so that we get the crispest picture we can make. This digital camera consists of pixels. And what happens is it uses the basic idea behind the photoelectric effect. When, oh, there we go, much better. Uh, when the uh, photons hit, the pixels, they free electrons in silicon atoms. Let's get a nice view of the moon here up close. Look at all those craters. Pan up. We got some nice shadows to look at here. Here are the lunar mare. Uh, we're just starting to see where some of the Apollo missions uh, landed. And these are the so-called lunar highlands, which are much more heavily cratered, which actually tells us they're much older. Uh, great question, Raymond. I am not an expert on the names of craters uh, or the Mare. That's a good question. Thank you, Bob. Circular dark stain is a Mare. Uh, see him? That's one I think that we were looking at earlier. Uh, we do encourage, so anyway, when the pixels hit the uh, digital camera, they get converted into free electrons. The silicon atoms absorb the photons, kicking out of electrons, and then we can count those electrons. That's what digital cameras let us do. And so they allow us to measure the brightnesses of things much more accurately to well under a percent in some cases. So changes in brightness of less than 1%. And so we count those. Uh, smaller craters on the big craters are generally younger. Not exactly. So generally speaking, the darker regions are younger. Uh, they were once um, lava flows on the surface of the moon billions of years ago, uh, a few billion. And then the, the lunar highlands are a lot older, I think on the order of 4 billion years old. And they have more craters because they've been solid for a lot longer period of time, but they actually used to be molten. And so any um, impacts that hit the moon there in the past uh, were basically absorbed, much like a crater hitting uh, or an asteroid hitting the Earth's ocean, uh, just basically just disappeared under the waves of liquid lava. Um, let's take another close view of this. So astronomers started putting the first uh, digital cameras on telescopes in the 1970s, and the first um, they they were very expensive. 
relied on investments from the National Science Foundation and NASA. The military was also really interested in these because they had to go uh, digging uh, around the world to pick up uh, film canisters from their spy satellites uh, before the invention of the digital camera. The digital camera let them wirelessly transmit images down in real time uh, and save the military a lot of money, of course, and also sped up the speed of our intelligence gathering. And over time between the military and astronomy, we invested in making digital cameras have more pixels, denser pixels eventually became cheap enough to put into high-end consumer digital cameras, and the rest is history. Uh, we now have selfies in everybody's camera with millions of pixels each. This particular camera that we're using here has 16 million pixels. Uh, what I like to say about this story is that this was an investment in fundamental science uh, for the federal government. And today it's fundamentally changed our society uh, in ways we could have never imagined. So we always encourage uh, those of you on the call to consider uh, writing to your representatives and continuing to encourage uh, support and investment in fundamental science. Okay, great. So that's the moon. Hope you enjoyed the moon. We're going to move on now. Give you a nice long last look at the moon. Well, let me save that one. I'll just call it the moon. Being a little slow. I'm going to get a spinning wheel. Bear with me. There we go. And now it's pasted from my wife's um, slide. I'll slow down. My wife was copying and pasting. Let me uh, turn off my. There we go. Do not disturb. Now let's go back to the telescope. There it is. We're looking at the moon. We're going to go ahead and move to a favorite object of mine the Orion Nebula. I got to zoom out. Somehow that went a little too fast. Go ahead and bring up the constellations. There they are. And we're going to go very close to the setting sky now over to the trapezium. Okay, go ahead and watch the telescope move on the webcam. Here we get a bit of a better view in the upper left of that cylinder that contains a third mirror that direct the, directs the light either up to a spectrograph to the right, where is the digital camera that we're using tonight, or to the left to an eyepiece. Uh, the full moon view is gone, but uh, you can watch this uh, view later. This is recorded and we'll post it to our Twitter uh, page. For those of you that are interested, uh, here's not the view I wanted to show you, but uh, here is, uh, a view of our observatory, but our website for the observatory can be found on science.gmu.edu uh, slash research slash facility slash observatory. Uh, there is an older website. If you Google GMU observatory, it'll take you to our old website, costs.gmu.edu. That's not the right website to go to. That's about two years out of date for those of you that have just joined. Um, we do have during the semester when we're not in a global pandemic. Oh yeah, I could just paste it into the chat. Here we go. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, beat me to it. Uh, we do have every other week during the fall and spring semesters under normal operations, free public evening under the stars events where we have lectures uh, from nearby experts, we we are very fortunate to live here in the DC area, and so we get experts from NASA headquarters, NSF headquarters, uh, a num uh, NASA Goddard uh, that come and talk to us and give us presentations about things going on in our universe. And if you are particularly interested in uh, interested, we also have a philanthropic organization called Patrons of the Observatory, uh, which you can feel free. Uh, to join and continue to support our students and the research that we do here at the observatory. Now, where did my view of the, there we go. Okay, sorry about that, let me close that. Uh, okay, so we are now looking at Orion. You can see the moon now. 
Uh, I believe that's the moon, but we are looking really close to the horizon. So hopefully we're not too close. Yeah, we're pretty darn close to the horizon. Let's take a view through our camera. So I'm gonna jump right to it. We're gonna do a slightly longer exposure. Canvas telescope, sorry, I'm moving this out of the way of the chat, although you can't see the chat on your screen, you can see it on mine. We're going to do 120 second exposure in H alpha. Uh, that'll allow us to take have some time for questions over the chat. Uh, but right now we are taking a 120 second image of the Orion Nebula to take a look at what it looks like. Now the Orion Nebula, if I'm actually there while well, that's exposing, whoops. Uh, let me go back to here while it's collecting data and zoom in on it. Oops, I went to the wrong spot. A little bit off from where, no, we're actually, I think we're good. I think I'm a little bit off, bear with me. Yeah, I wanted to be there. All right, let me stop that exposure. We're pointing a little bit off. Sorry about that, good thing I checked. Okay, and then we'll do a slightly shorter exposure to make up for lost time. All right, uh, we'll take questions. H alpha, what is it? Okay, thank you, Raymond, for asking that question. So uh, first, let's talk about what we're looking at. Uh, uh, a blank screen again. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I switched desktops and came back. Um, so you may have to, Dan, rejoin or wait to, for it to refresh. If you're in the web browser, you might have to rejoin the meeting uh, to see the screen again. Uh, so we're looking at the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula obviously is in the constellation of Orion. It is a star forming region in the arm of a, a spiral arm of a, our Milky Way galaxy, uh, just over uh, a thousand light years away where newborn stars are in the process of forming. And that's in our own galaxy. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at it here in about 40 seconds. We're looking in a filter called H alpha, uh, and this has to do with quantum mechanics. Hydrogen gas has one electron in its um, atoms. And as hydrogen electrons change energy levels, they must absorb photons of light at exact uh, wavelengths or energies of those photons. And one of these energy transitions in hydrogen atoms in particular is at a red wavelength of 656.3 nanometers. And at that particular wavelength, in other words, when we take an observation, which we are, we're basically taking a very narrow red image of the Orion Nebula, we get a view of the gas in that star forming region. Okay, so it just came out. I'm going to center it up and that is, okay, we're slightly out of focus, but there we are. We're going to have to zoom out. Show the whole thing. I'll work on, we're also really close to the horizon. Let me tweak the stretch here. I'll try adjusting the focus a little bit. More. Let's start at the very center. At the very center of this image are four baby newborn stars. Uh, and again, I apologize for the slight misfocus here and we might be seeing some oscillations in the deck motor of this telescope because we're pretty close to the horizon. Uh, but these are four baby new stars called the trapezium. And let's see if I could touch up the focus. a little. Oh, it's gonna be another 90 second exposure. So I'm not gonna wait too long for that, but we can let it run while it's doing that. Let me make an attempt to adjust the focus. Hiding behind my chat window here. Okay. The focus mechanism is somehow 
connected. There we go. Let's try. Oh, shoot. William, I think we ran the focus off the rails tonight by accident. Okay, so this might be the best focus we can do tonight. That's okay. We'll look at things that uh, um, we can fix. As I was going to say, things can definitely uh, go wrong. All right, we'll look at Pluto, Rob, as we as we get there. Uh, so this is a trapezium. It's a baby um, set of baby stars that uh, don't uh, don't call them babies. Each one of them is more than uh, ten times the mass of our sun, uh, but they're young. They're new. They're not going to live for very long uh, before they go supernova. But they are so bright, they're blasting away the dust and gas. Uh, we have a, a technical question from Munich. Yoon-J just checking, is the camera attached to the telescope, a commercial SR mounted? This is a um, SBIG 16803 commercial camera that's attached. It's currently uh, liquid cooled. That's unfortunate. Our focus mechanism is uh, busted now. We're, we're not going to be able to adjust the focus later tonight. Yeah, I keep bringing the questions. Uh, and it's blasting the way the gas, the trapezium is blasting the way the gas and dust from which this um, cluster of stars form and lighting it up at the same time. So we can see this beautiful, although slightly now out of focus, nebula of gas and dust um, that uh, is left over from the formation of those newborn baby stars. And this is the middle belt star, or sorry, not the middle belt star, the middle star in the sword uh, of Orion. All right, so this is the Orion Nebula a baby star forming region. I'll show you some other CRISPR pictures of these later. Okay, let's go ahead and move the telescope again. We're now going to take a trip out of the uh, out of our galaxy to um, another galaxy besides our own. Now, someone had asked earlier about um, flowing to uh, the Andromeda galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy, unfortunately, is not up tonight. Uh, but we will go instead to the Whirlpool galaxy. Uh, so, in this case, someone asked about what happened to those stars. Are they dead yet or anything like that? Um, they are not. Uh, hold on. Let's find. Uh, so, sorry, I wasn't actually seeing the telescope. There we go. Let's watch the telescope on the webcams as we uh, get over to another object. Uh, the question about the trapezium, since they're over a thousand light years away, that means the light from those stars really did leave those stars over a thousand years ago and are just getting to us now. Now, they, those particular stars, there's Venus, by the way, in the, um, that we can now see it uh, in the, the lower left. And that's, I believe, is the moon uh, in the telescope slit. Uh, as we're moving the telescope, uh, those stars have likely not died yet um, and not gone supernova but there are plenty of stars that we do see in the sky and uh, some of them may have in fact gone supernova since we looked at them however most of the stars we see in the sky are very close to us relatively speaking our galaxy is a hundred thousand light years across so as long as that star that you're looking at is within a few thousand light years of us uh, the light left only a few thousand years ago. Sometimes you see on the internet uh, memes about all the stars that you see being dead because the light left so long ago. That's not really true. What I am going to show you now um, is the um, uh, a galaxy containing hundreds, a uh, few uh, hundreds of billions of stars, much like our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and that light is from several million light years away, and that light uh, left our uh, left that galaxy several millions of years ago. Thank goodness we've got our telescope open tonight to collect that light. 
And indeed, the light from these hundreds of billions of stars, some of those stars uh, have died within the past few million years since they started their journey. Uh, that light started its journey on its way towards us. And so some of the stars that we're going to look at next may indeed no longer exist. Uh, yes, do you see the trapezium is still, those, those stars are blasting away um, uh, through radiation pressure, blasting away the gas uh, left over from the formation of that cluster of stars. If you were to look at Orion in the infrared, light that's redder than red that we can see, uh, in fact, uh, that light, um, the uh, star forming region of Orion fills the whole spiral arm. Uh, and so it actually fills the entire constellation of Orion. That's just some of the brightest uh, star forming region that we can look at. Okay, we are now at uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy. And let me bring up our digital camera again. I'll go ahead and save this one. Uh, exposure again. Apologies, I have like a bazillion windows open uh, between the chat. We are up to 142 participants at the moment. We'll bring the um, camera control window back into view. Seems to have lost it. Ah, it's underneath the chat window. And we'll go ahead and do a long exposure. We're now going to switch to a broader band filter in red. Uh, so suffice to say, things do get go wrong. We may have a network issue. If we get disconnected, I apologize. Uh, we'll pick up a session. We'll do another one of these sessions in the future. I hope this is uh, entertaining for you. Um, uh, Dan Jay's daughter asked, can we see a black hole tonight? Um, I do believe the Whirlpool Galaxy has a supermassive black hole at the center of its galaxy, but by definition, Black holes themselves do not give off light, but there is material around the black hole that does give off light. And just the past, within the past two years, scientists were able to image uh, the ring of light around a supermassive black hole in, uh, the, in, the constellation, in the galaxy of M87. There is also a supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy. Thank you for the link, Rob. If you want to see that picture, uh, there's a link in the chat. Uh, we do have a supermassive black hole in our own galaxy, about 4 million times the mass of our sun, roughly 24, 25,000 light years away. It's not going to cause any danger to us, uh, but it's there. And in the centers of most galaxies, we believe there are supermassive black holes. Uh, there are also black holes uh, the si uh, similar in mass to our sun. Any star greater than 25 times the mass of our sun, and they do get that big, up to 150 times the mass of our sun, those black holes will give off, um, uh, will give off, uh, those, sorry, those stars greater than 25 times the mass of our sun will go supernova and produce uh, black holes uh, anywhere over three times the mass of our sun. We're going to zoom out. Here we go. Here is the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, there we go. Let me play with the stretch a little bit and bring out some of the features. So I talked about what I was doing earlier. I'm mapping the number of electrons that got counted in every pixel to values. Uh, and I goofed it up a little bit. Let me uh, play with this a little bit. Got it? Okay. Uh, I'm mapping the number of electrons counted in each pixel into an, a grayscale intensity that we see here on our screen. So there is the spiral whirlpool galaxy. And I'll zoom in on that and make my screen bigger so you can get a good look. There we go. And again, the telescope is out of focus tonight and we had a technical problem. It's not moving, unfortunately. I could try uh, disconnecting it, but it doesn't look very good tonight. We're gonna have to go there in person uh, tomorrow and uh, 
try playing with it, but unfortunately, our focus mechanism is not doing well. Uh, sorry, what was the question? You can hear them. I can hear somebody, yes. It was an unintentional question. All right, so we have spiral arms like in the in our own Milky Way galaxy. We're inside our galaxy, so it's a little bit difficult to uh, see the structure of our galaxy. Uh, but uh, uh, up here we have um, a satellite galaxy that is in the process of colliding with the Whirlpool galaxy. Um, it's smaller. We have our own satellite galaxies in the Milky Way as well. Uh, like uh, the large and small Magellanic clouds. I can play with the stretch here just to show you how bright the cores of those galaxies are. Actually, having a telescope out of focus actually makes for some nicer views of these extended galaxies, not quite as crisp. Uh, but here are spiral arms. You can see they're brighter, but downtown galaxy in the middle is much brighter. That's where the stellar density is the highest, but you are looking at the light of over 100 billion stars that traveled millions of years to get to us tonight. Okay, that's the Whirlpool Galaxy. Why is it spiral shaped? That is a great question. Uh, and that is a great question. Uh, part of the reason, part of the answer to that has to do with physics. Uh, as clouds of dust and gas contract, uh, they spin um, and they pick up the rate at which they spin. You can imagine a figure skater going into a jump, they start with their arms outstretched. And as they go into the air, they pull their arms in close to them and that causes it to, it to spin faster. And that's a weird trick of nature's bookkeeping called the conservation of angular momentum. As things shrink, they spin faster. It is a fundamental law of nature. It's one of the reasons why it makes it easy to ride a bike, That why it's easier once that you get going uh, on riding a bicycle to keep that bike upright, whereas a bicycle that's still will fall over a lot easier. Okay, let's go ahead and save that one. M, oh, actually it's Whirlpool. Slip to another target. So the next one I wanna take you to is M82. Uh, sometimes called the Cigar Galaxy, uh, other times uh, known as a Starburst Galaxy. Let's go over to the web camera and watch our telescope move. Interestingly enough, about a uh, hundred years ago, astronomers debated whether these spiral nebula were inside the Milky Way or not. And uh, we thought maybe that they could be young stars, but it was Edwin Hubble, why the Hubble Space Telescope, one of the reasons why the Hubble Space Telescope is named after it, uh, uh, they, they were able to measure the distance to these galaxies using a technique that relied on the pulsations of stars and show conclusively that the, uh, the galaxies lied outside our own. We're actually seeing a blinking light now on the webcam, and I think that's a tower on our campus. That's a, okay, now it's gone. Okay, we're now in position. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Cigar Galaxy. And I think we'll do a similar length exposure. Uh, we had a question, how old is the telescope? The telescope is about 10 years old, a little bit less. Uh, and uh, it's fully computer controlled, as you can see. Uh, we had a question, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, great, the telescope tracked the target. Yes, it does. Uh, thank you, Rob, for asking that. Yeah, the sky turns. Uh, it spins 24 hours in 24 hours. Uh, not exactly 23 hours and 56 minutes is uh, the time it takes for stars uh, to make one revolution uh, around the sky due to the Earth turning underneath uh, the fixed 
uh, distant stars, relatively fixed anyway. Mm -hmm. We're almost uh, waiting for that exposure to finish. I'm going to go see if anyone's unmuted. We do encourage you to come back after um, the um, uh, pandemic ends and come to our free evening under the stars and get to look at these objects with your own eyes. Uh, in the fall, of course, uh, the sun's in a different part of the sky, so we see different uh, we see different views. Oh, here we go. This is the Cigar Galaxy M82. Uh, this is what is known as a starburst galaxy. Uh, so we're seeing another uh, spiral galaxy edge on, except this one's, I think, is more irregular, and we are way out of focus, but that's the best I can do tonight. Um, but we see very, we see a dark lane of dust across the middle of this galaxy, and then we see bright pockets of light uh, from this galaxy. And what we're seeing is bursts of star formation uh, taking place in this galaxy. This galaxy is higher star formation than any of the nearby uh, galaxies to our own. Thank you for joining everyone. We appreciate, you know, of course, feel free to sign off whenever you like. We'll keep going. All right, so let's, uh, that's the M82. And I'm going to go ahead and see that one. Uh, again, this is a galaxy containing on the order of 100 billion stars, several million light years away. Uh, the recording will be posted on our Twitter account, uh, GMU Observatory, and we will post it up probably on our website as well. If someone is unmuted, so if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, I will try to find them. We'll look at the picture for a little bit. Great. All right, let's go take a look at the next object for tonight. All right, so we got a request for Pluto. I don't know where Pluto is in the sky tonight. Let's take a look. Uh, let me take a look around the sky. I believe it is called the Star Galaxy, yes. Who knows up yet, but uh, I'll trust Rob on this one. Let's go take a look for it. Oh, yeah, all right. Go ahead. We'll go ahead and watch the telescope. Uh, Pluto. Oops, sorry about that. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so for those who are joining late, I'm Dr. Peter Plafchan. I'm a professor of astronomy at George. Thank you, Merrily. I'm looking for muting Merrily. Feel free to call anyone else that needs to be muted. We are now muted. Great. Let me just make sure I didn't just command it to slew below the horizon because I do not see Pluto here. Pluto still below. I might have to abort this, but let's let it run into the ground. Yeah, okay, we're gonna have to try that later. So Pluto's still too low in the sky. Uh, we'll have to give it some time to come up. 
Uh, let's go ahead and go to a cluster of stars in our own um, galaxy. Talking about. If you're just joining us, please mute. Did he leaving you these cards to pull out? Is that okay? One can figure out who's talking. I'll go. Thank you. Is that you, Samantha? There we go. Okay, we're going back up. Watch the telescope slew. And so we're going to move. We've got a nice view of the telescope there through the dome. to Dan and Jonathan for uh, helping me keep track of the participants. Just to show you some fun little controls, we have a lamp here in the um, observatory that we use to uh, collect calibration data. Uh, and watch me turn it on. There it goes on. See the dome light up? These are night cameras, so they adjust their exposure times automatically. I'll go ahead and turn it off again. It's off. And disconnect our lamp. Uh, we have a nice view now of the motor that controls one of the two axes. Uh, good question from Charlene on the Pleiades. The Pleiades, unfortunately, are, I believe, set already. Uh, they're pretty low. Let me just double check. Uh, they're really close to the horizon. We could try chasing them. Yeah, why not? Now, the Pleiades are actually fairly large on the sky. Uh, and we have um, a fairly um, uh, small field of view with our digital camera, but we will be able to take a look at some of the stars in the Pleiades. But I think what you're going to see, actually, we'll stay with this cluster for now, because uh, that's getting a little too close to the horizon for us. But with this cluster of stars, uh, it's very similar to the Pleiades, a little bit further away. Uh, that's a good question on the grid. Thank you, Rob. Um, just to elaborate a little bit, the grid we see on the screen, this is our view of celestial coordinates. Now we have latitude and longitude here on the um, sky, uh, uh, on the Earth, on the surface of the Earth. If you imagine projecting latitude and longitude out on the sky, astronomers have a fancy name for that. And we <coughs> call that uh, right ascension and declination, right ascension is essentially the equivalent of longitude and declination is essentially the equivalent of latitude. So this is an imaginary grid on the surface of the sky. Astronomers, modern professional astronomers today don't use constellations so much. We do use them a little, but in order to tell the telescope where to point, uh, we need to use coordinates and numbers uh, to communicate with the telescope and where uh, to point it at. So we use coordinates uh, to memorize things on the sky. All right, so we are now at the uh, cluster. Let's take a, a exposure on that. I'll do a, a little bit shorter because these are fairly, um, this is a fairly bright cluster. Maybe put in the red filter. Yeah. Keeping the windows here open, bear with me. Close that, but I do want to change the shape. So we're now at the telescope we're exposing. We now see the digital camera that we're using because this is an infrared camera. We we see it's running a little bit uh, hot right now. We actually chill it the sensor temperature to minus thirty Celsius. That cuts down on the noise in our digital camera. Uh, so we can see these really faint objects uh, with our telescope. 
The shape of the universe, that's a good question. The visible universe uh, is roughly a sphere, uh, but we don't actually know um, what the shape is beyond what we can see. We don't live on a flat earth and we got a, unfortunately, a, still out of focus telescope, but here's a nice view of the Chi uh, Persei cluster. I think this is Chi and not H, let me just double check. Yeah, so the Chi Persei cluster. It's a double cluster of stars. There's one right next to it. Uh, and this is a um, roughly 10 to 15 million year old cluster of newborn stars. You can see that there's no gas uh, visible in this image, unlike Orion that we looked at earlier, the gas now is completely gone and we just see the leftover cluster, open cluster of baby stars. Uh, these stars will eventually disperse throughout the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. We had a technical question earlier, which I missed. Oh, the surface we use to flat field your images. Uh, the surface we use to flat field our images is the inside of the dome uh, when the dome is closed. Uh, not perfect, not ideal. We're eventually going to put a flat field screen on the inside of the dome. That's on our list of things we would like to purchase someday. Again, I apologize for the out of focus image. I know this is still a pretty good view, uh, but unfortunately our focus mechanism uh, hit a limit switch tonight. There we go. Let's go ahead and save that image. Uh, but there's several thousand stars here. We could take a longer exposure and we see even more. Now, unfortunately, these stars are slightly streaked and uh, out of focus, but you can see that this field of view is full of stars. Each one of these dots is slightly elongated, but each one of those is a star. Slightly, slightly crowded area. You might consider this like a suburb of the Milky Way galaxy. All right, let's close. Oh, I think I can. And let's go back to our telescope. Uh, it is a double cluster. If we zoom in on where we're pointed uh, with the telescope, we have a nice view, a virtual view of the sky right here. Uh, and so we're looking at this cluster. I could pop over here real quick and show you the other cluster. It's one of the rare, in our Milky Way at least, this double cluster of newborn stars. And we'll let that crank and uh, take another one minute long exposure of that double cluster. If we go back to the webcam view, you can barely tell that the telescope even moved. Yeah, good question, Chris, and thank you for the answer, Dr. Parks. All right, some, uh, some stars do get out of the galaxy. Oops, let's go back. Oh, we can stay there. Back to our night sky view. Back out. So, so far tonight, we've looked at a planet. We've looked at a newborn baby nursery in the Orion Nebula. We've looked at um, other galaxies that have hundreds of billions of stars, millions of light years away. We've now looked at a slightly older cluster of uh, newborn stars. It sounds old, 10, 15 million years old. But compared to the age of our sun at 5,000 million years, the stars that we're looking at right now, oh boy, we got some, uh, we had a telescope jump. That one's pretty awful. Uh, so we are seeing some deck oscillations tonight, and then we're also out of focus. So bear with me. I need to redo that exposure. Um, Rob, you're getting to see the, the ugliest part of our campus telescope. Uh, the motor encoders, it looks like we had a small right ascension jump in the coordinates and we had a small oscillation and declination uh, and we just happened to capture that during that 60 second exposure. These are not worms in space time, but we are looking at incredibly small angles on the sky 
uh, to give you some idea of the types of angles that we're looking at, um, uh, if you imagine the 360 degrees in a circle, and you take one of those degrees and split it into 60 pieces, we call that an arc, one of those an arc minute. So there are 60 arc minutes in a degree. And then we split those into each one of those arc minutes into 60 pieces. Uh, and we call that an arc second. So there's 60 arc seconds in an arc minute. In other words, an arc second is one three thirty six hundredth of a single degree. These little wiggles you're seeing on the sky right now, and they're still showing up, unfortunately. Um, we're probably gonna have to go on to a different target. Uh, the little wiggles we're seeing right now are only a few arc seconds across, smaller than your eyes could resolve. So we're looking at very high magnification, uh, but there's a very distorted view of the H uh, Persei cluster. Um, all right, so let's go someplace else. And now I want to take you to the Crab Nebula, show you what happens when stars die. So we're going to go ahead and uh, oh, pretty nice. Okay, that was really nearby. Let's try taking another exposure. That's where I got that curve. I feel like uh, I think I accidentally clicked on the wrong thing. All right, user error. There we go. I'll abort the exposure that's right now. Zoom out. Let me stop the exposure that's running right now. Go back to the webcam view so you can see the telescope move. We might be going below the horizon. I need to keep an eye on that. Well, we're peeking back up. We're traveling a far way around. Let's go back to the webcam and keep an eye on it. Uh, whoops, sorry about that. I did not mean to do that. Uh, you saw it looked like the dome sped up there on the view. That was not actually what happened. It was just a lag uh, in my um, network connection getting the view of the dome here. But it looks like we are now in position for the Crab Nebula just north of Orion. I believe that's in the constellation of Gemini, but I could be wrong about that. There it is. That's what the Hubble Space Telescope view looks like. Uh, let's go ahead and see what our campus telescope sees. And we'll go ahead and take a long exposure again. The Crab Nebula is pretty faint. But let me tell you a little bit about the Crab Nebula. Uh, the Crab Nebula is a leftover remnant of a supernova explosion. It went off nearly a thousand years ago in the year 1054, when much of Europe was in the Middle Ages. And the only um, humans to uh, record it in writing, uh, at least the, the one that everybody knows about, I believe there are others as well, uh, but China astronomers recorded um, the, the location of a new star in the sky, uh, and this was in this position in the sky in this constellation, and uh, we now know and believe that this nebula that we see on the sky is the leftovers of that supernova explosion of a star between 8 and 25 times the mass of our sun when it died. Basically, uh, when the star was nearing the end of its life, it had run out of fuel in its core, nuclear fuel to fuse um, hydrogen, um, sorry, all the way, elements all the way up to iron. Uh, that did not come out very well. Uh, what is going on there? Are we having significant light pollution? Let me take a, oh, uh, well, let me take a look at this one and see what's going on. Still having significant oscillation as well. Tell you what, let me park the telescope and unpark it. Uh, that is not the nebula that you're seeing right now. Are the colors of the nebula 
real. Um, yes, they are, but uh, I think we, let me see what direction telescope is pointed. We're looking, I mean, the sky is still a little bit bright in that direction. Let me try different. I'm not gonna see much, uh, still probably a decent filter. Let me do the following. I'm going to park the telescope and unpark it to see if we can squash this um, deck motor oscillation. Okay, so we're going to go here. We're not going to fully shut shut it down. I'll tell you more about the pulsar when we're doing it. We're going to go back to the video camera and watch the telescope slew. Green is going haywire over here because it's very zoomed in. So let me zoom out. Here's the moon uh, rotating through the field of view again. All right, so the 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 crab pulsar, the crab nebula, uh, was a nebula on the sky seen, you know, for centuries, and we didn't really know what it was, uh, but we now know uh, that. Uh, in the year 1054, about a thousand years ago, a star between eight and 25 times the mass of our sun went supernova. The core was full of iron uh, and that iron couldn't uh, get hot enough to ignite another nuclear reaction to sustain the star, but the outer layers were still making more and more iron, increasing the gravity in the core to the point where, um, yeah, Uh, thank you for that private message. Yeah, I, that was an accident. Um, uh, we have um, a ball of iron about the size of the Earth, about three times the mass of our sun. Our sun is about 300,000 times the mass of the Earth. And um, they saw, well, okay, it's a good question. How did the Chinese astronomers see that if they didn't have telescopes? They didn't have telescopes. They didn't see the nebula. They saw the supernova explosion. And that supernova uh, was close enough that it would have been the brightest star in the sky for a couple of months. And so they noted it and then it faded away. Uh, we've since rediscovered it after the invention of the telescope. And in any event, this ball of iron the strength of gravity was so strong at the core of this star, more than 900,000 times the mass of our Earth, crammed in a space the size of the Earth. Gravity became so strong that the electrons couldn't hold each other apart from the force of gravity, so that the, gravity, uh, the electrons started colliding with the protons and making neutrons. Suddenly, all the electromagnetic forces that generally hold atoms together disappeared, and you just had a ball of roughly 10 to the power of 51 neutrons that collapsed to the size of a city. Something 900,000 times as massive as the Earth, the size of a city. A teaspoon of this material weighs as much as Mount Everest. It's called a neutron star. Or in other words, uh, another name for it is a pulsar due to the strongly beamed radiation coming from the surface of this neutron star, and it also spins very fast. We've since discovered uh, with telescopes that indeed at the center of the Crab Nebula is a uh, sorry, one second. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, let's go here, let's unpark. And then let's go to our target again. We now have the pulsar at the center of the uh, Crab Nebula. And it has been imaged uh, to be pulsing uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. I think the rotation period of it is around once a second. I think it may be even shorter than that. I don't remember exactly the rotation period of the pulsar, but it's something uh, three over 900,000 times as massive as the Earth the size of a, spin, a, a city, thank you, spinning uh, roughly 30 times a second. One of the most extreme um, 
uh, remnants uh, of a dead star in our universe. The only one more extreme than that, of course, is a black hole, which can be produced when a star more than 25 times the mass of our sun goes supernova. Okay, well, we're coming back to uh, the Crab Nebula, and we'll give it another shot uh, to take a look at it with the campus telescope. I think we're still seeing some twilight uh, light, however, from the, maybe some moon glow uh, and some uh, day glow still with our sensitive telescopes. We're not quite able to pick up. We weren't able to pick up in this picture. Good question. What's inside a black hole? Uh, the current mathematical theory posits that at the center of a black hole is what we call a singularity, where time and space get stretched so much that we don't really know how far it goes. Uh, we don't have a theory of quantum gravity yet at this time, but we do know that time and gravity get stretched so much uh, inside the event horizon of a black hole uh, that it's basically unlike anything we've ever experienced. Uh, no one could survive passing through the event horizon of a black hole a few times the mass of our sun, but theoretically, a supermassive black hole, you could uh, potentially survive passing through its event horizon were it not for the intense field of radiation around there. Um, let's go ahead and kick off that exposure. I believe we're on target now. Let me just double check. I think we have a, a bit of light pollution tonight, unfortunately, but let's see if we can get a good image. And the telescope altitude is 18 degrees, so we're high enough above the horizon. Uh, no human or satellite has been inside a black hole. Um, I don't know the distance to the nearest confirmed black hole. We know Cygnus X1. I don't know how many tens of light years away that is. Uh, there is a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy around 24, 25,000 light years away. And fun fact that if we were able to travel to that black hole and back towards the rest of the universe as we're falling into it, time outside the black hole would appear to speed up because time itself is getting stretched near the surface of a black hole. And as you cross the event horizon, if you're looking back outside the black hole, you would see the entire future of the universe pass by. Well, this isn't looking very good. Let me try a narrow band filter in H alpha to see if we have any better luck. But at the moment, I don't think we'll be able to see anything. We're just getting a little bit too much uh, light pollution for me to be able to pick out where that nebula is in here. Sorry about that. It's pretty faint, and I, I was aware of that. Let's see if we can pick it out with this narrow filter. But I don't think we'll have any more luck with that. Ah, center of the Crab Nebula. That's where the pulsar is, it's a rotating. Neutron star, apologies for that. Okay, Cygnus X1, thank you for looking that up, Rob. Maybe you have that memorized, I certainly don't. I have a feeling we're not gonna be able to pick it up in this exposure either, but we will try. Or maybe just a little too much light pollution in the direction we're looking. Yeah, so we're not gonna pick it up in this exposure. This is just static. Okay, so apologies, we're not gonna be able to look at uh, the Crab Pulsar tonight. There is a um, other nebula that I could try and show us. Up my notes. Let's try and take a look at the Owl Nebula. Now this is what happens when a star more like our sun dies gently uh, into the starry night, uh, and we'll take a look at it. 
watch the webcam, uh, watch the telescope slew as we move the telescope up towards, uh, oh, you know, we might be having some clouds. Well, that's what's going on too. Uh, the skies, let me do a quick weather check. We might have clouds rolling in. It's already 10 o'clock. Might be rolling in a little bit earlier than I would have liked. Yeah, okay. So we're starting to get some partly cloudy skies, so we might have just gotten unlucky. And you can kind of see that in the lower camera on the left. Well, it looks like we're starting to see some clouds come in. Uh, and it's only going to get worse, but we'll do our we'll do our best to dodge the clouds and show you some more celestial objects tonight. Hi, thanks for joining, David, and from the Furman University Physics Department. I don't even know where that is, but I'll have to look it up. Uh, yes, this session is recorded, and we will be posting it to our uh, Twitter account, GMU Observatory. So we're definitely starting to see some clouds look, come in. They're coming in a little bit earlier than I would have liked. Let me go ahead and check and make sure our humidity is okay. It is at the moment, but it is starting to rise a little bit earlier than it was supposed to. We'll have to close up if it starts getting above 80%, which it is forecast to. We'll have to keep an eye on that. Okay, back to our telescope. Looks like it's mostly in place. The dome is still spinning. Now let's take another exposure. Our digital camera, I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. Uh, let's go up, oh, I don't wanna, uh, well, yeah, let's, let's go back to the red filter, and try to do a broad bend image. It should be easy, so if we don't see anything, we're probably seeing clouds again. We're waiting. I'll try to look over the questions. Does anyone have any other questions? And then once again, thank you for joining us. Feel free to type your questions into the chat. I'll check the weather radar, make sure we've got, it still says 0% chance of rain, uh, but I don't want to take any chances. It's fine on the weather radar. Thanks, Robin. Thanks for joining us. We encourage you to join these in the future. Follow us on Twitter, GMU Observatory. Uh, if I flip over to PowerPoint, you might lose the screen, but uh, uh, science.gmu.edu uh, can take you to the observatory. Let's go back to proper team viewer. Oops, sorry, that's my own personal. Uh, Partner ID, um, if you want to control my computer, but there you go. All right, so it's there. It's pretty awful right now. I think we're starting to see some clouds. Let me try and adjust the stretch uh, to show you the leftovers of this uh, dying star. I think I could do a better job of this. Bring the black up. Improve the contrast here. It's not great. Let's try doing a longer exposure. That'll help a little bit, and I'll zoom in on this one while we wait. This one's pretty faint, and we're still out of focus. It's very faint, ghostly thing you see here. Uh, Blobby thing that you see here uh, is the death throes of a star that was around uh, the mass of our sun uh, when it died. And uh, in the process of that happening, the outer layers of the star were uh, shoved off uh, in an unstable uh, round of nuclear fusion uh, after the star lived a few billion years. Uh, we had a question for David while we're waiting for this longer exposure, undergraduate projects and research conduct with a telescope. That's a great question. Uh, let me post the Twitter link in the chat. Oh boy. 
Maybe someone else can. Oh, I have to select everyone. Okay. Uh, this should work. Uh, we also have an email address, gmuobservatory at gmail.com. Uh, and our website was pasted above, and I'll just paste it again. Uh, and here's the link to our website. Okay, so to answer the question about the research we do with our campus telescope, our students as undergraduates get to take a series of classes. Freshman astronomy majors get to take an introductory observational astronomy class where they get to use this campus telescope to collect data. And uh, our senior astronomers uh, that are majoring in physics or astronomy get to take a class on, uh, again, using the campus telescope and observational astronomy. Uh, this uh, dying stellar remnant I'll try to get a nice view of it there, even with the out of focus telescope. Um, uh, th yeah, okay, I forgot what I was going to say about it. Anyway, left over at the center of the star is a white dwarf. Uh, if we go over to our virtual sky view, uh, we can get a nice look at uh, what that looks like with a better telescope. But there, there it is. And you can see this kind of three star pattern we have. And that's the same three star pattern we have here uh, with our campus telescope. So same, same view upside down, um, uh, but it's the same view. Okay. Uh, and it, thank you, Dorothy, for posting that. Wow, you pulled out all this information. Are you familiar with George Mason? You know all this, that's great. Yeah. We also um, conduct research in support of the NASA test mission every uh, every clear night that we can, even during this global pandemic, we've been collecting observations uh, on clear nights uh, when the weather is cooperative on exoplanet candidates. These are planets that uh, are exterior to our own solar system. They orbit other stars. And the NASA test mission has been in orbit for two years now, absorbing, uh, observing large fractions of the sky finding candidates and we've been contributing well over 50 observations 50 nights worth of data over the past two years with students uh, collecting that data helping to confirm or reject some of the signals um, that the nasa test mission has identified one of those is going to be published soon uh, and we have several others uh, that we've helped confirm in progress it's just a we haven't uh, finished writing those papers yet. That's a great question. We have another question about doing another event on May 16th, uh, the, the smiley face. Okay, the smiley face is not a real smiley face. So that's not gonna happen. That's not a real event. Um, I have heard of that and it is a meme circulating on the internet. Uh, before, the claim is that before dawn, a crescent moon Venus and Jupiter will align. Uh, it is not, um, it's our, It's uh, digitally manipulated. Uh, there was a conjunction of Venus and the crescent moon that took place uh, 10 years ago. And uh, that, um, that was, it added an extra picture of Venus to make it look like a smiley face. That being said, in the pre-dawn hours uh, in May, Jupiter and, um, Mars will be coming quite close together on the sky, but I, I don't think I'll be getting up at um, four in the morning uh, to give you a, a nice show. Uh, but uh, yeah, that does happen. You do get a, it, it will eventually happen that you get something like a smiley if, if uh, everything does align. And there was something like that where Venus and the moon did align 10 years ago, looked like a blinking smiley face. Uh, and there was another similar event where the planets were more further apart from the moon. Uh, but the one that you've seen floating around the internet is, is uh, um, not actually real. All right, that's good. I saw that too and I was like, what the heck? And uh, I looked it up, but uh, 
we, I did look into that. All right, so I think we're starting to see some clouds and uh, Rob, do you have any other suggestions on things we might want to look at tonight? I got a great question about the Analemma Society on uh, at Turner Farm Park. Uh, I, so I'm in my third year as a professor here at George Mason. I am going to be tenured uh, next fall. Uh, so I, I have actually not heard of the Analemma Society. So feel free to send me an email. Um, my email address is Pete Plach, uh, the N is chopped off at gmu.edu. I just typed it into the chat. Feel free to send me an email with information about that organization. There is an organization in the community that we do partner a lot with, and I do want to give a shout out to them tonight before we end this session. Uh, specifically, uh, we uh, work with the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, we'll head over there next. Uh, the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club uh, meets on our campus every second Sunday of the month. Uh, okay. Rosetta. Rosette, thank you. Um, yeah, sure. It hasn't set yet. Let's let's take a chance. Uh, and the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club does come to our campus every month, and they also have, uh, we do also open up our telescope for them most months when it's clear out uh, and give telescope tours. So if you can't make our evenings under the stars on Monday nights, please look up the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club. They do meet monthly, and they're always looking for new members. It's great to come here. Uh, I'm sure the Analemma Society is fantastic as well. Uh, the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club will also have public nights where they set up a bunch of telescopes uh, for you to look through a few times a year at parks and darker locations around uh, the state of Virginia. Thank you for the link. Thank you all as Twitter handle. We found my, oh yeah. Yeah, let me show you mine. Uh, here's mine. I gave you the observatory, but this is mine. And let me go ahead and show you the dome and the telescope as we're slewing. We're, we're already there. I just catch up there. That was a little weird. All right, and let's go ahead and take a look. I think we're back in the clouds, so we might not see anything, but let's at least, uh, let's tell the dome's still turning. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look. Maybe we'll get lucky. It's pretty faint again. Uh, we'll try looking at it in red and see if we can uh, pick something out. And there are some additional galaxies that would be fun to look at. Let me um, pull up one more and take a look after this. I know a good one to go to. This one's a lot of fun. So you've heard about spiral galaxies. I'm going to try and show you a hard spiral galaxy, and maybe we'll take a look at the black hole galaxy too. Let's see which one is it? This chain is pretty faint. Let's see if the clouds permit us to look at some more galaxies. Good night, Rob. Thanks for joining. I gotta check on the humidity again. Looks okay. Oh, dang it. Sorry, apologies to those of you that uh, uh, lost the uh, view of the screen at the moment. Bring up our view. There we go. I hit the minimize button on the wrong. Uh, the recording will be posted to our Twitter page, uh, and uh, there we go. Oh, okay, saying goodnight to Jenny. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for staying on the line. It's been very helpful to have you on the call, uh, operating the telescope and talking at the same time. Okay, we're going to go look at 
uh, NGC 2903 after this. Let's see if we can find the Rosette Nebula through the clouds, if the clouds have parted. Fingers crossed. Rutherford Road observing. Well, that's a no, but uh, just to double check. Actually, no, it's a yes. Look at that. We just got to change the stretch. Uh, it's just too faint, and we're seeing some um, some light pollution. Not, we're not going to be able to pick that out. Unfortunately, not. Okay, let's try something else. A little brighter, maybe in a different part of the sky. NGC 2903. Sorry, Rob. Oh, really? That's really close to the horizon. Well, it was a shock. <laughs> oh, we're coming up in the sky. Good. Okay, that's better. I had my uh, colors reversed. Let's watch the telescope as it slews back up in the sky. It's a little tiny telescope. Uh, attached to the side of that, it's about this big. That's a finder scope and an alignment telescope uh, for this uh, computer controlled uh, telescope that you can look through. Oh, that's cool. I did not know that the Analemma group sets up telescopes. Every Friday night. That's great. We need to get in touch with them. Then. Okay, here we are. Let's go ahead and take an exposure. This is a more Kensington view. I think we can get away with a slightly shorter exposure on this one. That's mostly in place. Everything is looking good there. Humidity. Get this back to high. Altitude. It's great. And let's change one more time because it's awfully. I don't think it's actually refreshing right now, but it's getting awfully close to where I start becoming uncomfortable. Good night, Tim. All right, so what's different about this galaxy that we're going to look at? It's a relatively bright galaxy uh, that uh, has a bar, uh, a, a stretched rectilinear shaped uh, middle rather than a round middle. And there's two different types of spiral galaxies. That, uh, and even our own Milky Way has a small bar as well. And so we might be able to catch and see uh, the, the elongated center of that galaxy in a second. Here we go. Ooh, that's pretty bad. Okay, so sorry about that. Not that great. Let's go with a different stretch. This is pretty bright. This is a pretty bright galaxy, so we're probably looking through clouds still. Increasingly thick clouds, too. All right, let's see if there are any other clear patches of the sky we can go to. But, you know, I think we'll give it a little bit more time and then we'll try a couple more objects and then we'll call it a night. Looking at my list of targets. Try M64, the Black Eye Galaxy. Uh, we also have a mailing list. If you go to our website, which is linked to in the chat, uh, there is a link to sign up for our mailing list. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to find, so if you would like to sign up for our mailing list, feel free to email me, uh, and I will go ahead and send you a link to sign up for our mailing list for future events. So 
Go ahead and watch the telescope slew. You can definitely see we're starting to have a lot of clouds um, on screen and maybe even a, a little bit of condensation there on the webcam. So I'm probably probably should be closing up soon. Matt, thanks for joining. Glad to have you. Got some different objects that we looked at last time. I think this uh, the Black Eye Galaxy will be slightly different view than uh, the one we're looking at. And if uh, it's a cloud map, so I can't really show you. Um, I can't see which direction the clouds are coming in from. But hopefully, this will be uh, slightly clearer off in this direction. Okay, we're there. Let's go ahead and take another exposure. You can see that galaxy that we looked at earlier, um, but it's just too faint to pick out any of the detail uh, at the moment. You can make a little bit out of the bar. You can see it's a little bit elongated if, if your eyes are, your eyes you might feel like your eyes are playing a little bit of tricks on you. But if you look carefully at that galaxy, you can kind of see the bar going uh, with my cursor up and down in that view. Okay, here comes the black eye galaxy, which is definitely brighter. So let's see uh, the view that we have. Let me adjust the screen stretch. There it is. That's all right. We're still looking through clouds, unfortunately. Um, all right, so I'm going to call it a night. Um, but we do see the core of the galaxy there. But unfortunately, our viewpoint uh, is uh, our vantage point. Unfortunately, we're looking through some clouds, so it's not as great of a view. Uh, you're welcome to stay online while we close the telescope, and you can watch that. Uh, and thank you all for joining tonight. So we're going to go ahead and start by parking the telescope, bring it back to its position, where it's already very close to it. And I'm going to go ahead and move the dome while I'm at it. So I'm going to check that, and I'm going to and we're going to go ahead and watch it close. So thank you all for joining. Please sign up for our Twitter account. Follow us on Twitter. Sign up for our mailing list. Uh, I'll post a link to the mailing list on the Twitter account as well. And thank you for joining tonight. And we're going to go ahead and close the dome now. And you can watch as if you missed this at the beginning in particular. You can watch uh, the lower shutter start to raise uh, with the hydraulic uh, pumps uh, pulling that shutter up. This will take a few minutes to close. And it's been great having you all on the call. And thank you for joining us here at George Mason University virtually. I hope you all stay safe and healthy. Part. Go ahead and disconnect it. Go ahead and close this. Here, uh, let the telescope warm up. Uh, the camera warm up. Connect the camera. And now the bottom shutter is closed and we're going to watch until the top shutter close. And just to help that virtually, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn the lamp on again. Uh, and we're gonna see that it lights up the 
the dome inside, so we know that the shutter isn't closed yet, because we shouldn't see the lamp coming on with the shutter closed. The top shutter is still coming up and closing. Thank you all. Thank you for joining. We'll be concluding this call in about five to 10 minutes. I'll take any questions that people want to ask. Thank you, Sarah, for joining. Thank you, Becky. I haven't actually gone outside, but I'm pretty sure we've got cloud coming in. I might double check. The lamp on again, so you can see that the shutter is almost closed. Actually, no, that's wrong. Still not almost closed. Still a few more minutes. on the dome. Oh, it disconnected. That's my problem. I got I when I disconnected the telescope. All right. No wonder it was taking so long to close. So I let it go ahead and continue closing. Now I believe we can see it moving again. Still closing up the dome, but we're almost done. Still unmuted. All right, we're almost closed. You see, it's just coming over the rails now to meet the lower shutter as the upper shutter closes. It'll seal off the light on the inside in a little bit, and then we can turn. I'm going to turn the lamp off. There we go and turn it back on, on again. Beautiful. Okay, it looks like our dome is closed. Go ahead and turn that lamp off. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, the telescope's already parked, but I'm going to home it and park it one more time. Let me go ahead and close out this WebEx here in a minute, but I think that's all for tonight. Thank you, everyone. Uh, soon, thank you for joining. Have a good night.
Thank you to all the observatory TAs and uh, to our um, friends of the observatory club members. And thank you to uh, Rob for joining us tonight. It was a pleasure to have you all online. Thank you, William, as well, our observatory TA.